and uh, welcome. I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Hadley Powell, and I'm chair of the Museum Council. Um, it's my great pleasure tonight to welcome you to a reception celebrating uh, the exhibition Cecilia Vicuña, Quipo Desparecido, or Disappeared Quipo. I know that's how she wanted it to be titled, so I thought we would call it out. Um, we are th among the first to see this exhibition, um, which has a really special connection to the Museum Council, as it's supported by the Council's Artist in Residency Fund. Uh, this fund was formally established in 2008 to provide opportunities at the MFA for interactions for living artists and to showcase their work. Since then, a portion of proceeds have contributed to exhibitions like Disappeared Kipo. Uh, council members should feel proud of our important philanthropic contribution to the cultural life of the museum by way of this initiative. Our next event uh, is this Saturday, this Saturday, October 27th, which is the Halloween at the MFA, an annual favorite for families and kids hosted by the council. Uh, soon after, on November 14th, is the School of the Museum of Fine Arts sale, uh, which is a great reception and a fun opportunity to collect and look at artwork by our talented friends over at the SMFA at Tufts. Uh, now I have the great honor of introducing the three people who are the most instrumental in creating this exhibition. Uh, we are deeply grateful to welcome the artist herself, Cecilia Vicuña. Cecilia is a New York-based Chilean poet, artist, filmmaker, and activist. Her work addresses pressing concerns of the modern world, including ecological deconstruction, human rights, and cultural homogenization. Cecilia was the 2015 Messenger Lecturer at Cornell University, an honor bestowed on authors who contribute to the evolution of civilization for the special purpose of raising the moral standard of our political, business, and social life. Cecilia has devoted a significant part of her artistic practice to studying, interpreting, and reactivating, in act, in reactivating kipos. Kipos are complex record-keeping devices created by ancient people of the Andes. Over the next 20, 25 minutes, we look forward to learning more about the importance of kipos in, the ground, in, in this ground break, and this groundbreaking exhibition. Cecilia, a very warm welcome to you, and congratulations on a beautiful exhibition. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Co-curating the exhibition are Dennis Carr and Liz Menzel. Dennis Carr is the Carolyn and Peter Lynch Curator of Decorative Arts and Sculpture. Dennis was a co-curator of the MFA's 53 gallery, Art of the America's Wing, and a contributing author of the book, A New World Imagined, Art of the Americas. He holds graduate degrees from Yale, Yale University in the history of art and the Winter Tour program in early American culture. He most recently curated Collecting Stories, Native American Art. Liz Munzel is the Lorraine and Alan Bressler Curator of Contemporary Art and Special Initiatives. A Fulbright Scholar to Chile in 2006, Munzel holds a BA in International Letters and Visual Arts and Visual Studies from Tufts University. A minor in, with a minor in Latin American Studies and a master's in cultural studies from the Universidad de Chile. Between 2012 and 2017, Liz held a visiting curator post at Harvard University's David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. Since 2012, she has worked to establish the MFA as one of the first encyclopedic museums in the US to fully integrate performance art into its exhibition and permanent collection. Her writings have been published in print and online publications, such as MoMA's Post, Notes on Modern and Contemporary Art Around the Globe and Art Forum. Following the program, we encourage you to visit the exhibition, which is open just for us on the second floor of the Lindy Family Wing. Cecilia, Liz, and Dennis will be on hand for more conversation. We also have a reception in Bravo, which includes a fun play on the completo, or Chilean hot dog. We're thrilled to have some new faces tonight also. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Museum Council, please find me or Laura Murphy, straight in the front, um, at a reception following the program. It's now my pleasure to turn things over to Liz Munzel. Hi everyone, it's so lovely to have you all here to celebrate Cecilia's presence and exhibition and also um, Dennis and my collaboration, um, which really is the outgrowth of me thinking about Cecilia's practice since about 2007 when I met her on a beach in, on the coast of Chile, in central Chile. 
Um, I, as a Fulbright scholar there, responded to um, many aspects of her practice. Um, in Chile, she is an absolute giant in the history of contemporary art and the, the present of contemporary art. And um, I was very excited as um, a, a young scholar of, of her work um, that she did an open call um, responding to the uh, shortage of sea life um, and asked people to come to the beach to dig into the, their feet into the sand with her to invite the clams to come back to the shore where fishermen could then share them with, um, with the population. So I met her in that context, um, communed with her and many others on the beach that day. And when I returned to the US following my graduate studies in Chile, I uh, wanted no, more than anything to be able to bring Cecilia's practice to greater attention in the US. Um, and so this is um, a very exciting moment for me to be able to bring her work um, home. And at that, that same year, Dennis and I figured out, Dennis was in dialogue and, and met uh, Gary Erton, who is the Dumbarton Oaks Professor for Anthropology at Harvard, who has dedicated um, about 25 years of his professional life to studying, um, interpreting, and deciphering um, the kipu, these ancient Incan um, record-keeping devices that Hadley so um, aptly explained. So Dennis and I combined these interests into one exhibition that consists of Cecilia's uh, major new commission that she developed for us. It's a large scale sculpture with video projected on it. Um, images of it will um, pass through on this loop of, of slides that we have for you. Um, and um, a display also of five ancient kipu that are on loan to us from Peabody um, Museum over at Harvard. So these elements come together in one gallery setting to really commune the past with the present. Um, the amazing thing about this collaboration for me is seeing how Gary Erton's perspective as an academic, um, as a scholar, really was thirsty for Cecilia's per perspective as an artist. And that's because these objects, the mysterious kibun, um, really contain a wealth of information um, from census uh, data to being land deeds um, to more narrative information like the creation stories. And uh, we, we know how they're read at this point um, in a decimal system but oftentimes we still cannot decipher the information that they contain. They were banned by the Spanish in 1583. They were burned, they were buried, and um, really the information they contain was largely lost to history. Cecilia, through her approach to these objects, um, activates I think, the spiritual and ritualistic dimension of, of uh, making them, the kipu makers, or um, she calls them the breathers of knots because they would chant and sing when they made them. They were tactile objects, a language really experienced through touch. And so her approach to the kipu perhaps helps us piece together the different um, aspects of this puzzle that Western scholars could not really understand themselves. Um, so this really wonderful relationship between Cecilia and Gary, and I think between Dennis and I, um, has helped create a, a very um, rounded out um, exhibition that we're very excited to share with you uh, following the talk. Um, I think Dennis will, would like to add a few words and then we have some questions for Cecilia. Thank you, Liz. It's been a remarkable experience working on this exhibition with Liz and with Cecilia and with Gary, and also our partners at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, there, is, there are two uh, commissions from Cecilia that are on view simultaneously, one at the Brooklyn Museum and here at the MFA that just opened. And uh, these exhibitions uh, seek to bring back voice um, and language, a, a language that was largely lost because of the colonial period, 
Uh, when the Spanish arrived, uh, they discovered the Inca Empire stretching for almost 3,000 miles from what's now modern-day Ecuador all the way down the western side of South America to the middle of Chile. And the Incan Empire was only a century old or so at the time the Spanish arrived in the 16th century. And the Inca operated this very large empire without the use of written language, only through the spoken word. And they kept this empire together by using these devices called quipu. And as Liz described, there are different kinds of quipu. Um, some are narrative quipu, and some are uh, numerical or administrative quipu. And the administrative quipus are the ones that we have on view in the exhibition. Um, and over the last number of decades, scholars have worked to decipher these objects because uh, in the 16th century, the Spanish were threatened by this native language that they didn't understand. And they went so far as to ban quipus in 1683. Many were burned or, or lost. Um, the quipus that survive down to us today are largely found archeologically. Sometimes they're buried. Um, and they, sometimes they're found in archives. And these devices, they're, they're knotted cords, and they were made and read by kupu, or knot makers. And each community in the Andes would have a certain number of kipu makers who would keep records. And as Liz mentioned, they might be census records, they might be land records, they might be records of tribute that was owed or paid, and these small, uh, bundles of cords would be carried on the body uh, by runners who would run from place to place and would carry this information with them. And they knew how to, to, to record and to write. And these objects um, are, are layered with different kinds of meaning. The way that the cords twist, either to the left or to the right, the location of the knots, the size of the knots and how they're tied, the colors of the strings all record important information to the Inca Empire. And you'll notice in the exhibition, among the five quipus that we have on loan from Harvard, um, they're very complex objects, and a lot of them are multicolored. They look kind of tan from a distance, but when you get very close to them, you can see that there's indigo blue, there's deep red, there's dark brown, there's different shades of cotton from light tan to darker brown. And all of these colors had great significance in how uh, information was recorded and then read. Um, and these objects were like palimpsests. They could be you know, tied and untied and retied. And there's a number of pictures from a very important chronicle of uh, the Inca Empire that was done in the early 17th century that shows images of these quipu makers uh, uh, reporting records to rulers or um, carrying them on their bodies. Just really, it's remarkable. We don't have a lot of information about uh, these devices from the 16th century onward, and it's up to scholars like Gary and artists like Cecilia to recover this lost language. So we were going to um, start with a few questions uh, for Cecilia. This has been a, a really remarkable project, and I just wanted to, um, to ask you, Cecilia, to reflect on uh, the importance of this particular exhibition you know, within your long career, um, why this exhibition is different or special to you. of the Andean world is that all these things are like fractal images and uh, weaving relationships. So the thread of voice, the thread of water, the thread of life, 
are always in interaction and are always reflecting each other. So to thank you for supporting this exhibition, I couldn't do it in, if not singing, because I understand that the Museum Council has made it possible for the Kipu to come to the MFA. So the Kipu and I say thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Liz. And when I began doing it, um, all the workers are around me. We had a team of how many people? Like 10 people working. But before anybody even touches the thread before going up, the first thing that goes up is the sound. In the Andean view, the sound crosses dimensions the way water does. And to do a kipu here at the MFA is what in Andean terms we call a pachakuti. Pacha is the mother of space-time, and kuti is turning around. So it's the kind of event that turns around a history, a narrative of what kipus have been until now. Gary Orton, who has devoted so much of his life to the study of Kipu, said this exhibition was like a dream for him because even now he continues to find Kipus that are hidden in museums around the world and the museums don't even know what Kipu is. And this is the reason why I call it the disappeared Kipu because you would think that a record-keeping system that is probably as old as writing itself from the Middle East, or uh, as complex as the Phoenician alphabet that we use for writing our words even today, has been really disregarded, or forgotten, looked down upon, even in its place of origin, meaning South America, meaning the Andes, meaning Peru. And so to do an exhibition of this order, of this scale, of this magnitude, it really sends waves, waves of turning around the value system that assigns to these creations a completely different place in time and space. Cecilia, can you tell us about how you first encountered the kipu as a child? Yes, um, I was a very curious child. I grew up in the countryside, uh, but I was born to a family of artists and intellectuals that were very often persecuted, jailed, or in exile because of the violent history of civil and political struggles in Chile. But at the time I was born, my family had the most extraordinary compound of little adobe houses, each one with a fantastic library of books in many, many languages. And many of the women in my family, including my two grandmothers and some of my aunts, were wonderful artists. So it was in the library of one of my beloved aunts, Rosa Vicuña, a sculptor, that I discovered a book that had probably, this is, I'm reconstructing a possible history. It must have been in her a home and in one of these books that I encountered Kipu. And the first record I have of Kipu appearing in my life was my journals. I kept very intense journals as a teenager in Chile. And I wrote in my uh, notebook, and I have preserved this note, the phrase, El kipu que no recuerda nada. That means the kipu that remembers nothing. So in that moment, when I thought of the kipu, I immediately was turning around the colonization of the mind, which is the worst kind of colonization, because this colonization is what is keeping uh, South America as an enslaved uh, place, even now, in my opinion. And all this image of modernity is really based on brutal exploitation and destruction of the land and the cultures of the peoples. So this teenage girl turned around the disappearance of the kipu, even in that moment, by bringing 
the kipu as an acknowledgement of knowledge, wisdom, and memory lost. So in that act, the kipu that remembers nothing, I was sort of planting my uh, devotion to, uh, to search in my own dream world, in my own uh, poetic universe, for uh, the question, what this can possibly be? And I have been doing them for 50 years. So the installation at the MFA uh, incorporates images of objects from both the MFA's and Brooklyn Museum's amazing collections of ancient Peruvian textiles. And we're fortunate to have uh, three of those textiles on view in the gallery with the kipu. So I was wondering if you could talk a little, Cecilia, about uh, the use of these projections and um, the importance of, of weaving in the Indian world. Yes, you know, just before coming here, uh, we were having a meeting with Meredith Montague, which is uh, one of the textile experts here in the museum and a woman of tremendous knowledge. And she uh, was uh, telling me how she has been reconstructing one of the most mysterious technologies that involve, are involved in the textiles that are now in the exhibition. And in those same books that I read as a teenager, uh, there were many images of these pre-Columbian textiles. And actually, my Aunt Rosa even had a Nazca textile in her studio. And so uh, this fascination with the textile universe of the Andes for me has been infinite. And for anybody who has been studying these textiles, people say that it's the most complex textile uh, tradition and culture in the planet itself. And even computers, not even today, can reproduce some of those technologies. It is a passion for complex, precise thinking. It is a passion for a form of mathematics that we are only beginning to dream about now. So these people who didn't know how to read and write had uh, an, a, an ability to project the structures of a scaffolding of symmetry, asymmetry, to an extent of complexity that is really mind-boggling. And as a result of that engagement with numbers, and Gary Orton has a whole book about the Andean vision of numbers. If you are interested in this subject, it's a fascinating book and is transformed into an art of the highest order. So I remember Gary uh, saying at one point that uh, what is happening with the ancient art of the Incas is that art and science are one. And this is how I experience my own art too, because I don't think I could have found in my soul or in my body the strength to, to do kipus for so many years without people really paying any attention to it. And that's another aspect of why this exhibition is important, not only for, for me that has been doing kipus silently for so long, but for the kipu itself. And so the fact that the kipu uh, is a witness, uh, this is the other perspective, that we come and go, but the kipu keeps the memory. And now we know that the thread itself has, as if it were, a cellular memory. And so these images of, of the ancient people are now reconfirmed by quantum physics and so forth. And this is what has sustained me, the passion for science as it speaks back to the ancient indigenous ideas. So one of the exciting things about doing a project that's just a bit outside of my field in some aspects um, is that I get to learn so much about, about ancient history. Um, but here's where Dennis can correct me at, at any point. Um, my understanding about the philosophy and really this philosophical underpinnings of Incan society is that there was a um, configuration of um, lines that extended from a mountaintop. And they're called the seque, and basically it's like a, um, a circle, and from that, many lines that extend, that extend from it. 
and they connected all of the Incan territories, but also these lines connected the cosmos and all people and all living beings and the earth as well. So jump in, Dennis, if I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> um, and when I first heard that, I thought, oh, how, how, how crazy to imagine, you know, these lines connecting imaginary lines. And then, well, you know, imaginary lines exist in our conception of the world today. They just divide people. They divide countries, right? I mean, these are completely, borders are completely fictionalized accounts of um, what a line on the, on the earth is. It doesn't, m many times doesn't exist beyond our, um, our own human drawing of it into, into the land. So this actually makes sense about how humans think about territory. We have to either divide it up, but you actually don't have to divide it up. You can also unite it as the Incans did. Um, so I wonder, Cecilia, if you could tell us a little bit about how you hope um, through this exhibition that people might, uh, audiences today might gain um, a closer understanding of the Incan uh, way of life and ancient modes of thinking. Yes, I, I think that the Inca perception of the, use of the universe and of themselves really belongs more in the future than in the past. Because this idea of the kipu as a cosmic umbilical cord, the, as a metaphor for the union of all, is really the most important thing from the perspective of, of the Inca universe. The Inca universe called itself Tawantin Suyu, which means four parts interconnected or interwoven four corners. So the idea that all these realities and these dimensions are interconnected as fractals and, and in, in, in absolute um, uh, correspondence of universes that are always different, but always in relationship. And I think this is what we can learn from it. And I have to tell you that well, you will have very soon the experience of being in the kipu. And to be in the kibbutz, for example, some people were shocked when I, in Documenta, you, you can see it in some of the images, I created kibbutz that were 12 meters tall, you know, or 10 meters tall, and, you know, 6 meters in diameter. And so people uh, have a sort of uh, uh, the idea that this is something um, outrageous to do something so large. But what I try to say with that is that there is the scale of the imagination of the Incas. And the scale of imagination not, not only was reflected by the Seque system, which, as you well said, connected to the birth of life in the galaxies, to the birth of water in the summit of the mountains, and the circulation of life in water. It connected every single community to its responsibilities of care for the land, care for the water. So it was an organizational system that was intangible. But it was so powerful that, for example, when I think of why did the little girl Cecilia imagine immediately the kipu as a mental image, as a kipu that remembers nothing, that had the power to direct my life. Because I knew uh, in writing that piece that something was landing happening in my relationship to the kipu. And so the kipu began weaving me into a system of knowledge, into a system of understanding. So what is this uh, knowledge that we all share? It's the field. Now in quantum physics is called the field. It's the field that makes us one species, that makes our imaginations to speak to each other even when we're not even aware that we are sharing these imaginations. So it's a huge lesson for the future. We either come together into the union of all of us as humanity, or there's simply no more humanity in very short time from now, the way we're going, destroying everything. So for me, the kipu is uh, not only uh, a nostalgia for a universe of justice and, and social equilibrium. For example, Gary, in his book of numbers, 
of the Inca world, he defines the, the perception of numbers as, uh, let me find in my mind, how did he call it? A, a reparation. So number systems, which were so complex, were devised always to find balance and equilibrium between distributions. So the idea of, of justice was embedded in the notion of numbers. Can you imagine a culture more opposite to ours to have numbers do that, express that ethic, uh, ethical uh, vision of what is the purpose of mathematics and arithmetics themselves. I think that, to me, is beauty itself. It's the beauty of, of justice, it's the beauty of togetherness. And that is what we, we need, and that's why I think we're here. So I, I have one last question for Cecilia, then we're gonna open up the uh, floor to questions, so get ready. So one of the things that, to me, makes this exhibition especially important is that it shows us how critical textiles and um, fabric and thread were to Andean society. Today in our modern world, we have very different value systems. Um, but in the ancient Andean world, uh, it was these, these fiber, it was a, a, a fiber-based society. Um, every, almost every aspect of society was based in one way or another on the twisting of threads. And we see in the quipus that they were used to keep records, but the ancient textiles in the collection um, also embed uh, knowledge, narrative, history, um, religion in these amazing objects. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about, Cecilia, is your interest in materials, the kinds of materials you use. Um, um, and to me, what's interesting is that the, the quipus in the show and the textiles in the show show not only a mastery of weaving structures, but of a mastery of materials. So the use of cochineal dye, or the use of cotton, or different kinds of camelid fibers. So if you could talk a little bit about materials in this work, or perhaps other works you've done. Yes, thank you, Dennis. It's, it's true, you know, that um, this notion, I, uh, I also I should sh mention that in terms of the fractal images, uh, you have the second system, the imaginary lines that least described, then you have the, the tactile kipus that were traveling in the chasqui system of the runners, and then you had the kapaknyan. This is a, a web of roads. So in terms of the material, the, 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 con the concept of material in the Andes is of, of an infinite, um, how can I say, exploration of the potentials of materials. And I discovered this in a form that is very primitive. I was one day, maybe 30 years ago, traveling in Lake Titicaca. And I noticed that, um, I, I suppose many of you have visited Lake Titicaca? Ha, has, have any of you been there? Yeah, I see one hand. Okay. Well, if you haven't been, I recommend it. It's just the most extraordinary place. And so I observed that the animals, the, the animals that are sacred for the livelihood of the people, the llamas and the alpacas, they were wearing these uh, sort of uh, things hanging from their ears. And if you look at them closely, they are unspun wool. So I was very intrigued by this use of unspun wool. And if you don't know what unspun wool means, it means the hair, as it is pulled from the animal, before it is spun, is just simply like a cloud of wool. It's like a nothingness itself. And so I started to see that this nothingness itself had a very important ritual use in Lake Titicaca, in the communities uh, today, I mean 500 years after the conquest. So I start to read about it, and I see that for the weavers, the shepherd women who take care of the animals, this unspun wool represents the cosmic gas from which the galaxies are born. Therefore, is also the place of the birth of water. And when I see that, I am, I mean, completely awestruck by the ability to transmit the cosmos to, let's say, the molecular structure of a piece of, uh, of hair. You know, and so this ability 
to think metaphorically and from the magnitude of the heavens to the magnitude of just a fiber of hair, which is maybe this long. And so one day I arrived in a, in a, in a shop in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I discovered that somebody has the, discovered a way of recreating the process of pulling the wool from the animal through a machine. And then these long streams of cosmic gas are available to be bought for $5. I mean, wow. And I got that, and I immediately started to construct these impossible structures. Because the material that I used for the kipu here, that you will see, is just pure and spun wool. So nothing holds it together. It should not be possible to even make it this long without it breaking apart. And so this is why this work works, because it is impossible and nothing is sustaining it. And you will see in the poem that I have written for it, other than the desire of each fiber to be next to the next fiber. To me, this is the subatomic particle that has not yet been found by the astrophysicists, but it's already theorized as the gluon that glues the cosmos together. So for me, the kipu is the manifestation of this glue, this glue that is non-existent so far until we find it. We're happy to take a few questions from the audience. There are microphones being passed around, so just make sure to wait um, for a microphone to come to you. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to ask about the significance of colors in your work. And so we've seen some pictures where you have deep reds, but it looks like the kipus we're seeing are earthy tones, um, or maybe color has worn away from them. So can you describe your use of colors and uh, sort of what it is signifying to you? Yes. Um, this is a very tricky, deep question, because uh, 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 the same is true, I mean, the colors are coded in the Andes, and I have written many poems about that. For example, um, the, from the Andean perspective, color uh, doesn't really exist, but what exists is the dissolution of color. That is to say, for example, uh, remember I was telling you about the, the, the wool, the unspun wool hanging from the ears of the animal? This wool is dyed in the colors of the rainbow. And the reason being that in the Andes, one color dissolves to let the other be. And this concept is called kisa. So it is uh, the idea of like, a, like a, each color uh, melts to allow the other to be. Therefore, it represents the fertility of the cosmos, it represents the existence of love. So I have taken my cue in my use of color from that, even before I knew that that was the case. I, I know that from a Western perspective, it's very strange to think that your body or your soul knows something before you know it, rationally, because you read it in a book or somebody tells you. But the truth of the matter is, for example, my first spatial weaving was blue. And why did I use blue? I sometimes have uh, used blue again, even though you didn't see them in this selection. And that was a sky within that I was doing. So you, you can say that in that moment, I am thinking like a regular Chilean person that sees, ah, the sky is blue, therefore I will use blue. Then I began using red. And I started to weave a lot with red. And until I found, I discovered, I don't know how I discovered it, that this red thread really represents menstrual blood. Until uh, I also began working with white. So I was working with red and white. And I found, I met 
a scholar, um, uh, Paulina Brugnoli is her name, and she tells me, do you know, Cecilia, that you're using the two principal colors of the sacred offerings, which is white that stands from, for semen and red that stands for menstrual blood. So it is in the connectivity and union be between black and red that the universe is uh, renewed, you know, transformed and renewed. So my relationship with colors is that I, I sort of, I follow the color and then the color teaches me where it's coming from. Hello. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for sharing all that wisdom that it's sort of like so ancient that allows us to ex experience the, the work of art, but also understand more about this technology, you know, about this kipus. And I had the privilege of listening to you uh, speak earlier, and something that uh, struck in my mind was uh, that you referred to this, um, so the, to the kipus, um, this sort of like thread as uh, sort of equivalent or um, related to the umbilical cord. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about that connection between this sort of primordial communicator uh, or communication structure, which is the umbilical cord and the structure of the kipus and your work. Thank you for asking that, that is really, a key, a key thing, and um, but your poor friend here, Cecilia, is so tired that if you don't ask me, I forget. And so um, I've never been so tired in my life, I think, as I am now, from having to this. But it's the most beautiful tiredness I recommended with my soul, because it's so beautiful what we are experiencing. Before answering about the umbilical cord. You see, I think in, in we were just speaking before between us uh, that uh, if this exhibition is a metaphor for the union of all, we as a team have experienced it. So it's not an idea, it's not a theory, we have lived it. So we are so, so happy and so grateful. And it really, you know, the, the word grateful is the same word as grace. It comes from the Latin gra which is the same as grada, meaning a stair. So when you're grateful, is that you're elevated to a different dimension. I wanted to say that as a way to thank the, the council again. Now the court. I had arrived in the US in, the, in 1980. I was invited to do a performance, and I have stayed for 40 years to continue to perform. And very early on in the 80s, I discovered this fantastic book that is called The Code of the Kipu, written by a team of brother and sister called Robert and Silly uh, Asher. And this lady, I think this is her part of, in the book, she suddenly says that the sensibility, the sensitivity of the, tact the tactility of the kipu must be related to the universe inside the womb. It is like half a line in a book of maybe 200, 300 pages. But when I read that, I boom, focused on that, and I knew that this was a tremendous reality because of my own memories of, of uh, being born. You know, I, I, I remember. And uh, in my songs for the kipu, I, I, I sing to, of the knot as El Niño. You know, El Niño, for me, the each knot is as if it were a baby. And of course, I immediately understood that's what it is. This is a female imagination, you know, feeling the cord, the umbilical cord from which hangs the knot, which is the baby. And this idea of the seque, where each uh, uh, spring of water where life emerges, is a knot, where each sacred site is a knot, is a representation of the society where each person is a knot of a collective weaving. So these are the images that are really uh, given to us by the notion of 
it being an umbilical cord. And the most magnificent thing I can say is that uh, a few years ago, I think it was in the year 2011, I had been invited to do, uh, again, a monumental kipu in Sydney, Australia. And I did that kipu uh, in homage to the color scheme of the Aboriginal paintings of the Australian uh, indigenous peoples. And I was composing the poem to go because in these exhibitions there's always a poem, there's always a song, there's always a construction, a kipu, there's always a performance. So all these things become like one piece. And I had just composed the poem of the umbilical cord in the kipu when suddenly my partner, the poet James, James O'Hearn, uh, discovers he's very good navigating in, in, in the web, and he uh, sends me this website that is a group of Australian astronomers had discovered the umbilical cord of the uh, Via Lactea. How do you call it in, in English? The, the Milky Way. The Milky Way, thank you. And you can see the picture of it. So they say, ah, this is where the origin of the Milky Way is, and you can actually see it in the picture. It's like a long thread, and from this long thread, this big knot, which is actually all the millions of stars circulating in a spiral. So the spiral is the knot and this long stream is its umbilical cord. How about that? <laughs> well, thank you all so much for your wonderful questions um, and for listening so attentively um, as we try to connect you with these incredible histories and futures. I hope you'll join Dennis and I up in the gallery. I'm not sure if Cecilia is welcome to go straight to the completo station and eat <laughs> if she would like to. <laughs> um, but Dennis and I will be upstairs for about 20 minutes to take your questions about the exhibition. Thank you all so much. <laughs>